Would life really develop differently on another planet? Convergent evolution. Pointed ears, blue skin, abnormal head, or reptilian jaws. There are a thousand ways in which science fiction, literature, movies, and alleged witnesses' accounts have depicted aliens visiting Earth. So different in height, shape, and somatic features, but still with one thing in common, a vaguely human appearance. But if in the entertainment world it is easier and cheaper to make up actors as humanoid ETs rather than as shapeless blobs or tentacled octopuses, in the scientific debate the criteria are evidently different. Yet there is still no consensus among researchers as to what these possible neighbors from the next galaxy should look like. Assuming it, not assuming they exist, are they similar enough to us or so different that our minds cannot even imagine them. Try to follow along as we will try to find out together, okay? Some argue that it is futile to speculate on the nature of alien life. Our imaginations would be too constrained by our own experience to be able to embrace the amazing heterogeneity and unusual possibilities perhaps realized in other worlds. Well, if I may express my personal opinion, I disagree. In my opinion, science can help us overcome such a pessimistic view, allowing us to make realistic assumptions about how aliens might be structured morphologically. Many like me are confident that the laws of physics and chemistry are unambiguous and universal, and they work on Earth just as they do on any exoplanet. If there is one thing we know for certain about aliens, it is this. They too, just like us, are a product of evolution by natural selection. Others, however, believe that biology is an exception. They find it hard to believe that the biological laws underlying Earth's evolution are also applicable to exoplanets. Carl Sagan, one of the most famous astronomers of the 20th century, was firmly convinced that intelligent life existed elsewhere in the universe. Yet he wrote, to our knowledge, however, biology is a literally terrestrial and provincial science, and we can be familiar with only one special case in a universe of diverse biologies. When we face the unknown, there are indeed good reasons to be cautious. But why should biology be terrestrial and provincial rather than universal? Shouldn't the laws of nature, physical, chemical, and even biological, be common to the entire universe? Fortunately, there is a strong component of scholars in the scientific community who don't think like Sagan. According to them, aliens, if they exist, cannot be so different from us. And to support this hypothesis, they usually invoke a well-known phenomenon, that of evolutionary convergence. Basically, species subjected to the same environmental pressures tend to develop by natural selection, similar to anatomical features. This is why a mammal like a dolphin looks similar to a cartilaginous fish like a shark. Even a creature that developed and lived in the liquid ocean of a distant exoplanet would probably develop a fish-like shape to move quickly. But just a moment, before we get into the details, it will be good to clarify which aliens we are talking about. On our Earth, there are currently some 20 million different species, from the whale to the gnat. If our discussion were limited to ascertaining the differences between any animals on Earth and any animals on an extrasolar planet, well, then we would already have the answer. Indeed, one need only consider the extraordinary variety of shapes and sizes of our fauna to realize immediately that an alien planet with environmental conditions similar to our own would probably also be home to millions of species extraordinarily different from each other. There would also be animals there, large and small, terrestrial and marine, flying and terrestrial, occupying every environmental niche available. Not identical in form to terrestrial ones, but certainly similar in function dictated by environment and evolutionary pressure. So that when we go out and actually discover a large number of Earth-like sentient worlds, we will find that most of the creatures on them took forms designed by physical and biological laws. Fish-shaped swimming organisms, 
bird, bat-shaped flying creatures, four-limbed turriculous creatures, and perhaps largely upright, two-armed, large-headed, bipedal sentients, humanoids that use tools. It should therefore be clear that when we speak of comparisons between aliens from different planets, we must mean only morphological comparisons, with sentient beings who have arrived to express a technologically advanced civilization. It matters little whether an extrasolar planet is inhabited by millions of very strange species. The point of this discussion is to answer the question, if aliens from another star system came to visit us one day, what would they look like? Hang on a sec, guys, before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality. First, a true alien would have to be bilaterally symmetrical, endothermic with excellent manipulative abilities, and have a rigid brain case. If we consider the living beings present on Earth, we realize that all the more complex ones, particularly on land, exhibit bilateral symmetry. That is, it is possible to divide the body with a sagittal plane separating two mutually specular halves. This is true for a human, as well as for a bear or a mosquito, but it is not the only possible configuration. For example, an octopus or a starfish exhibits radial symmetry. On Earth, all of the most complex organisms exhibit bilateral symmetry. The appearance of bilateral symmetry has been of enormous importance in the evolution of living beings on Earth. The earliest organisms with bilateral symmetry moved in a single direction, and this caused one end of the body to come into contact with its surroundings before the rest of the organism did. The sensory organs therefore developed on this end, because this enabled them to detect the characteristics of the environment in which one was moving sooner, and from the data from these organs to be processed more quickly. The nerve centers that perform this function needed to be as close as possible. Over time, millions and millions of years, this led to the development of a head which contains the brain and has the sense organs of sight, taste, smell, and hearing. Most scholars believe, based on what can be observed in the millions of animal species on our planet, that even a hypothetical, technologically evolved alien would exhibit some symmetry, probably bilateral. However, we must not forget, someone objects, that our evolutionary path is the result of a very long sequence of random events. So much so that if it were possible to restart from the same initial conditions thousands and thousands of times, not a single other time would this path be identical. And all the more reason that this would be valid in an environment, albeit similar, that is nonetheless alien to our own. A being developed in a distant world would might therefore not have bilateral or even radial symmetry, which would obviously make it appear quite different from us. Such a creature would appear very strange and ungainly to our eyes because of how our brains evolve, but it is still possible. But this is an objection that could be answered by saying that the diversity they are talking about could only occur among lower animals and not in a species that has been able to evolve to the point of technology. The reason is intuitable. Octopuses get by in their environment, but they certainly could not exist as land creatures. Moreover, no matter how pliant their tentacles are, they cannot manipulate objects in fine ways, an ability they did not develop because it was not necessary for the marine environment. Deciding factors would be the specific characteristics of the host planets. Earth's fauna, including humans, is absolutely determined by the history of the planet through millions of years of evolution, climate change, habitat adaptation, and mass extinctions due to external events. For example, the impact of large meteorites or the explosion of nearby supernovae. This means that even under exactly the same geographic and environmental conditions, i.e. in the case of a planet identical to Earth with the same astronomical and astrophysical characteristics, Evolution could certainly have taken total, unpredictable paths, and thus capable of producing differences far greater than a pair of pointy ears, but always well within defined limits. However, there are two environmental components capable of directing the evolution of an ecosystem. 
Gravity is a key factor, influencing the development of all organisms. In addition to limiting the size of land animals, gravity also imposes several very specific adaptations. We can see evidence of this right here on Earth. Organisms that made the transition from water to land had to develop complex limbs and skeletons because they no longer had the buoyancy of water to compensate for the force of gravity. Of course, on Earth with the same gravity, there are complex living beings of all sizes, from the mosquito to the blue whale, the latter probably approaching the maximum size attainable by any animal on our planet. But there are probably limits for a technologically evolved species. To be able to process metals, for example, a creature could hardly be as small as a squirrel, just as, on the other hand, a being the size of a brontosaurus would have serious difficulty developing aircraft capable of supporting its own weight, let alone space capsules. These are just two examples of how dimensions too small or too large would constitute, if not an insurmountable limitation, at least a major break on the technological development of the species. Imagine a hypothetical situation in which Earth's gravity is doubled. Although this would not necessarily force all complex life on Earth to reassemble a squat, turtle-like creature, the likelihood of being bipedal humans would decrease dramatically. Even if we could maintain our two-legged method of movement, we would certainly be much shorter and have larger bones to accommodate the stronger force of gravity. Meanwhile, an Earth with half the gravity would probably have the opposite effect. Earth animals would require less muscle and weaker skeletons to cope with gravity, and life in general would be taller and larger. While we can't theorize about the general characteristics of life in high or low gravity, there is no way to predict more subtle adaptations. Such adaptations would further alter the appearance of alien life. The atmosphere obviously also plays a role in directing evolution. For example, Arthropods that lived during Earth's Carboniferous period some 300 million years ago were significantly larger than their modern counterparts. Dragonflies nearly a meter long were running around in those days. And this was due to higher atmospheric oxygen content, up to 35% versus 21% today. And okay, all this means that similar environments developed similar forms regardless of their evolutionary history. On Earth, this is called parallel evolution. The canonical example is the mouth shape of the flamingo, which begins an almost exact replica on a small scale of the mouth shape of whales, even though they share no common history. Why? Because they are both filter feeders of microscopic organisms in the water and both have hinged jaws. That shape is the most efficient to do that job. And at that point, it's physics, not biology. If we went to another planet and found an animal with articulated jaws that eat the same way, it would have the same mouth shape. The same is true for all evolution in similar environments. The fact that the environment is on another planet is irrelevant. Final Considerations In short, for me, it goes like this. If the alien has come down to us, or at any rate possesses the means to make contact with our species, it will be of an intelligence at least equal to ours, and therefore, from an evolutionary point of view, can only be structurally very similar to us. It may be strange in all the ways you can't imagine. Scaly skin, number of fingers varying from three to five, ridges on the head, bad ears, etc. But it will definitely be similar to us in size, symmetry, and number of limbs, upright posture, head with eyes, and openings for mouth and nose. Of course, coming down the ladder of the spaceship will not be a gelatinous, telepathic blob, incapable even of using a screwdriver or tapping on computer keys. Nor will it be a cephalopod like the ones in the movie Arrivals, who took over the science of space travel by talking to each other in ink splatters. So what about you guys? Whose side are you on? <laughs>